Android library love. Yes, should we wait a few more minutes or should we just get started? I think you probably got work by after. So. All right, cool. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to going back and forth here, <laughs> looking backwards. Uh, but yes, welcome to Android library love. Life is indeed much better now. Uh, who am I? My name is Andrew Watson. I'm a principal Android developer at the Nerdery. And uh, I've been developing on Android uh, since about 2010. And now it's time for a shameless plug. Uh, I have an app on Google Play. If you've got an Android Wear device, uh, you should go download my app. It's, uh, it's called Wear RSS. And it's, uh, what you do is you put your RSS feeds into it, and uh, then it pushes the uh, it'll push headlines to your wearable device. So you can swipe your news headlines in the description. If you want to read the article that you're looking at later, you can swipe up, hit later, that sort of thing. So, so shameless plug. <clears throat> who are you? I am interested in uh, who uh, you guys are in the audience. How many of you guys are currently Android developers? And how many of you guys are just getting started? Has everybody more or less touched Android code? Okay. Okay. Cool. That's good. That helps. Because, uh, go ahead. Yeah, because there are two Android library talks right now. And this one is the, like, the, it's labeled as the Beginner. starter yes. session or whatever it's called. Yes. So it is entirely possible, I think it is possible that Daniel Liu is in another room probably giving almost the same, same presentation. Like, we literally did not coordinate, but we are probably going to be talking about the same libraries. Yours is better. Of course. <laughs> That's not what it was debated. Uh, but, so if you were to go and watch his notes, you, uh, you probably would see a lot of the same things. Honestly, if you guys got up and left and went to his presentation, he probably would do a better job. So, but I am going to, I will try and uh, make this um, about, you know, I'm going to stand, because I, I need to be looking at this. So what I can do is I can just... Over. Um, what uh, I, I am going to try and uh, orient this more towards uh, maybe beginning and stuff like that. So this will be good if you're getting started doing Android development. It'll actually be good to learn uh, these libraries that can really help you. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Android libraries that can save you a lot of time and effort. Uh, back in the old days of Android development, there used to be a lot of boilerplate code that you would have to write, and uh, Every Android project just sort of involved kind of rehashing the same types of classes, that sort of thing. But the Android community has really, really stepped up. And uh, so there are a ton of libraries out there, but I wanted to hit what I think are the highlights and will probably have an impact on uh, a large majority of projects that you would end up working on. I definitely want this to be informal. Uh, feel free to stop me, raise your hand, just throw something out, ask questions. Um, and uh, I definitely want to make this, this useful for you. So just, uh, yeah, hopefully it's uh, informative. So how will we break this down? <laughs> We're going to break this down by way of libraries I have used. And I thought that I would try and find some libraries that I haven't used, but I thought looked promising. But I think given time, we might actually, uh, not, there may not be enough time to actually cover some of that. So I think we'll skip that. But then I did want to open it up at the end and uh, open it up for questions or to discuss any libraries that you come across that you like um, and that you find you know, helpful. And the reason I'm, I'm covering libraries I have used is because I want to be able to rec recommend them good and give you good sample code. So there, there will be code in this uh, presentation. I'm going to be covering some of the ways things work. Um, and if it doesn't make sense, just ask. So on to the libraries. These are my pick picks. So first is a library called Butternut. It is a view injection library for Android. Uh, it's made by Jake Wharton, and uh, basically anything Jake Wharton makes is amazing, so learn that name. And uh, so this presentation is online, and all these links are live and good, so I will tweet out the um, URL to this presentation afterwards. I'm Creative Drewy um, online. If you search for Creative Drewy, you'll find me, and you, you can find this presentation, and you'll be able to click all the links and that sort of thing. So, uh, if you've written any amount of Android code, 
you will recognize this. Every one of your activities, fragments, whatever, you've got your views, right? And so you declare your private uh, views, or you, I'm sorry, not private, you declare your, uh, your view, your, your class level views, and then you come into onCreate or whatever, and you have to find bot view by ID and uh, do a nice cast and that sort of thing. You want to set an onClick listener or whatever listener on a, on a view, you've got to use the, uh, the callback there or the in interface. You can define it at the class level, but this is just super common, a lot of boilerplate, pretty, pretty tedious, that sort of thing. Uh, so what Butterknife does is it aims to really improve that code and really reduce the amount of boilerplate. So the big killer feature of Butterknife is this. What you do is you define your views, and then you use this annotation called inject view, and you just refer to the actual um, view in your layout. And then the key is to call this butterknife.inject, and lo and behold, these will then be injected into your class, and you don't have to do that crazy find view by ID type stuff. And it's just a lot, a lot cleaner. Um, and then you'll also notice down here is uh, I'm not having to wire up a set on click listener. There's this on click annotation, and you provide a reference to the view in, in your layout, and you set on click, and then you just put a function right underneath that, and it wires all that up for you. So it saves a lot of, just a lot of nasty boilerplate code. What's interesting, an interesting note, is you'll notice that I've got a submit button and a submit button. If I don't use this, this submit button class variable anywhere in my you know, activity, fragment, whatever, I don't even have to instantiate it. All I have to do is do an on click. So if, you know, like, if all you're going to do is on an activity submit, you don't need to have a class level variable for that submit button. You can literally just do on click. How, how is this performance? I'm just getting started with Android and I'm hearing, well, performance is always a big issue. Um, I've not seen this. Well, so what you'll hear from people is that Java's reflection is not particularly amazing, um, and Java's like annotation processing and stuff like that isn't the best. So in general, Java sort of and Android sort of fail on the on the performance front with things like this. But yet you see a lot of people doing it. So I've not seen what I would perceive to be a performance hit. It's worth noting that Butterknife is compile time. So all this really does. Oh yeah, you're compile, right. That's right. Yes, yeah. it's just going to generate those that's right. the ID. So it's very performance. Actually. It's effectively the same in this case. Um, it just makes your code look a lot cleaner. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, there are a number of libraries. I don't know how many of them we're going to cover. Uh, here, I can't remember how many we're covering, but a lot of them, when they have these annotations, it actually does do compile time, so it pre-generates code. So it's very, you know, it's as performant as it's going to get. It's not going to do a runtime. All right. Next up, retrofit. Retrofit is awesome. It is super snazzy. REST API. One more question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, on the, are there are there any yeah, you know? So this obviously seems like a better way to write code. Is, do you see any downsides to using Butterknife? Like, is it less powerful in any ways than just having the raw code mm -hmm. there? No. So I, no, I have yet to see any downside to using Butterknife. Um, it can be awkward if you're trying to access views and you're not. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. But Butterknife Inject has a lot of overloaded method calls where like you can't take it. Yeah. And you can intermix, or or is this? Once you yeah. Want? No, you can still do like find view ID and everything wherever okay. you want. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. This just this just cleans up your code, and and yeah. So the reason the reason that. I don't, I can't think of anything that might be bad for it is because it literally just eliminates weird boilerplate code. Like, why Google thought it was cool to make you have to like literally cast every view that you would pull out of your layout. You know, find view by ID. Tell me what I'm going to get. I mean, Java does have generic. You could have given it a type and at least it would have used the type. But for some reason, I think you see that, see that a lot like in, in Google source code. A lot of times it's just Code quality isn't always on Google's mind, um, so so yeah. Th for this, it's just it's really uh, you know kind of uh, saving you from that that nasty boilerplate. All right, so next up, retrofit. So this is made by Square, you know the the credit card payment people, and so let's see what. Uh, 
All right, so before I go forward, I don't know, has, have most of you guys tried to work with REST APIs, consuming JSON, and that sort of thing? Um, so historically, there have been a variety of ways to do REST consumption in Android, and none of them were particularly awesome. Uh, you might pull in like the Apache HTTP library, and you end up, uh, you know, extending whatever it is, net connection or HTTP connection. And then you get your, your, your JSON data back. You have to maybe process a byte stream. You have to manually parse the JSON and know the properties and blah, 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 blah. Retrofit eliminates all of that. It takes care of everything. So I will show you some code. So check this out. So this is how you use Retrofit. You define REST endpoints as an interface. So in this case, we have a user endpoint. And you define the object type that comes back. And then you annotate the interface method with at get, at post, and so on. And you end up passing in that annotation uh, the URL endpoint. And that is it for defining your, your uh, REST API consumption. To actually use it, then what you need to do is you use this class restadapter.builder, you, you, you tell it the base endpoint, so in this case it's you know, myapi.com or whatever, and then every call after that will append itself onto that, and then what you do is you do this restadapter.create, and it creates an actual, not, you know, an actual implementation of these endpoints. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes on here. Um, so for example, you know, if, if you're getting JSON data back, it's, you know, you, you give it a, a, a value object, a POJO, a plain old Java object, and it's going to get the JSON and automatically deserialize for you. And so when you make these calls, you're actually going to get hydrated objects back from these API endpoints. I think the next slide. Yeah, so this is how you consume, right? So by default, you do, uh, you, you make, you use your interface method. You, in the case of this call, I'm going to create user. I'm actually passing a body. I'm actually passing a, a, a method body because I'm posting. I'm sending data. And then you give it a callback. And then when your API returns, it'll call this success method. And if it fails, it will it'll throw this. It'll call that failure method. It'll get some, some log information and that sort of thing. By default, this methodology is asynchronous. So it will not block your UI thread. So it is actually happening in the background, and this callback will come back on, on the main thread. Any questions about that? Let's see. All right. A pro tip for retrofit is using the log level. Retrofit does a lot for you. It takes care of a lot of, of functionality. Like I said, it takes care of all your HTTP stuff, all your Data, you know, data processing, creates objects for you, that sort of thing. And it's kind of so you know, powerful and does so much that sometimes you don't know what's going on. Like you will, your API will fail and it will not tell you what's going on. So while you're developing, you should set log level to this log level full, and then your ADB logs will just be full of all sorts of stuff that's going on when it's consuming the API and you'll be able to see better like when errors come in. A lot of times, you know, errors are your JSON format is one way, but your object has the wrong property name or something like that. So retrofit can just save you tons of time when you're consuming your, your best APIs. All right, next up, Rx Java and Rx, the Rx Android extensions. So this is this is a huge topic. Reactive extensions and RxJava are super, super complicated. And actually, Colin Lee is going to be doing a presentation on this um, next, next hour, I believe. And so if you want to learn more about it, I'm sure he'll cover a lot more in depth. Um, so by, what I want to say is big time props to Daniel Liu, who is the other guy giving the presentation. He's probably talking about this right now. It was his blog post that really helped me understand how reactive extensions is uh, otherwise called observables. It, 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 reactive extensions deal with observables. And it was really Daniel Liu's blog post, this blog post that I referenced here, that really helped me wrap my head around. 
And so uh, observables are not dissimilar from, say, promises or futures in other programming languages. Does anybody know what those are? Basically what it is is it's a way to write functionality that has you know, callbacks, like you do this, then you do this. And it's a way of writing functionality in a much more sort of readable, parsable, understandable way. Um, and it allows you to write much cleaner code, but also have a lot of power. So the thing to know about reactive extensions is it deals with these things called observables. And observables are kind of just what they sound like. They're things that they do something and you can observe them. So an observable will say, hey, I do something. And so, cool, I'm here. And so if you want to respond to what that observable does, you have to subscribe to the observable. And so once you subscribe to the observable, then what will end up happening is the stuff that the observable does, the subscriber will respond and say, okay, so hey, observable, you said this, now I'm going to respond by doing that. So this code tries to get at what's going on. So I'm creating an observable from a list of strings. Now this is a very simple example. It's not something that particularly you may do on a regular basis. That's why I said so imagine, imagine this is a set of complex items. Imagine it's a set of operations. The weird thing about observables is they can wrap almost anything. It doesn't just have to be content. It can be an operation. You'll get to see how that works. But in this case, it can just be a collection of items. So this observable says, I have five items. And I'm going to e emit each of those items at a time. So what the subscriber does is the the, there are three methods. The subscriber has an on next, an on error, and an on complete. Let me just see what my next slide. What this means is for each item in the observable collection, this on next is going to get called. And it's strongly typed. So this observable. I don't is, see an on next there. No, sorry, it, uh, it's not named on next, but the, the, the argument, this argument is on next. And so I, I don't know, well, so this is where Java gets weird. So on next is of type action one. Is that confusing? Yes, it is. But actually later on, uh, you'll see, I think, you'll, I'm gonna show you a library that actually makes this more readable, and it actually makes more sense. But so what you need to know is that for each item in this collection, this method is going to get called. That's what you need to know. So the observable is going to say, hey, here's the string imagine. And then it's going to call this method. And I can say, I'm going to do something with it. Then complex comes in and it says, I'm going to do something. And then items come. So it, it runs through each one of these items calling this method each time. So it'll be imagine complex items for operations. And you can do something. Like you might. You might just literally populate a, a list view, a button, or something, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you can do whatever here. On error, if at any point as it's going through these operations, it encounters an error, it'll go here. And then when it's done, it calls this final method, on complete. So we've now gotten through every item in the collection, and now we're done. So it's a bit esoteric, and I hope I'm making some amount of sense, but the big thing to know about observables, if you take away anything, know that an observable says, hey, I do something, and you subscribe to it. And it's really that subscription is where the magic happens. That's where most of what you're going to do your work is. And I think as we look at more examples, you'll see how maybe they, they, they work together. So with the Android extensions to Rx Java, they provide asynchronous operations relatively easy. So what you're seeing here is I've created, I've created an observable, and this observable does something really complicated with strings. I don't know what, but it's very complicated. And so there's a method right here, and this method takes a really long time. So if this doesn't make complete sense, all you need to know is that this method is going to take a really long time when it actually gets called. So this observable right here, observe me, we subscribe to it. But there's this magic stuff that the Android extensions create called schedulers.new thread <coughs> and observe on Android schedulers main thread. This causes it to work asynchronously. 
And then when you wire up your subscribers, now remember when you subscribe, it looks like this. This is what a subscriber looks like. I'm just not putting it all right here. When, when you call these methods, this, the, the methods app in the subscribe portion, it's gonna happen on the main thread. So everything that this observable does occurs in the background thread, and then the response, the subscriber responds on the main thread. So, you know, like async tasks are dead. You don't need to use async tasks anymore in, in, in Android, because that was sort of one of the old ways of doing background threading. If you bring in your observable, um, your observable, you bring in Rx Java and Rx Android extensions, you can, you can literally encapsulate anything in an observable and then run it on the background thread. So the reason, a big reason we want to use observables or Rx Android is because it makes retrofit way better. So now in your retrofit interface, instead of doing like create user with a callback, you do create user and it returns an observable of type user. And now what you do is you do create user, subscribe, observe, so it's happening in the background thread, and then we do our subscribe callbacks. Our subscription, or you know, get the subscriber runs. So what, what was back here, instead of needing this callback, what it now becomes is this block of code. So it's much more readable. It, it almost looks functional, like you're not having to do all these weird nested callbacks. You just use your endpoint, and then you subscribe to it, and then when your data comes in, there it is. You know, so a really common operation in this function would be a toast. Maybe. Congratulations, you got your user, something like that. And so like I say, uh, we've really just scratched the surface. Observables can do tons of cool things. It really is about like functional programming. Um, you can do lots of interesting things with like data that gets returned. You can map it, you can transform it, you can filter it, all that sort of stuff. The, I, I think a good place to start can be the, the, React, the Rx Java wiki on GitHub. It's a little, obtuse, like they don't make any effort to make it understandable, uh, but it can at least let you know it's there and then as you kind of suffer through these things, you'll, you'll learn more about what it does. All right, next up, JSON. JSON is a serialization library made by Google, and I honestly don't know where it's hosted now since Google Code is going away. So I presume it's going to be moved to GitHub, but it, I, right now it's only Google Code. Whatever, I guess we'll leave it there. So all it does is it will take your object, convert it to a JSON string, and it will take a JSON string and convert it back into an object. Uh, retrofit uses JSON behind the scenes to serialize objects. But sometimes you don't need retrofit or sometimes you just need, you know, if you have an object uh, that you want to turn into serialized data and then deserialize it. On, actually, I'm using JSON straight on my Android Wear app because the phone goes and gets all of the headlines from your RSS feeds, and then it actually serializes them into one big string and just pushes it all to your watch, and then the watch deserializes. So that's how I'm getting data back and forth. Uh, complex object relationships and lists are handled great. So like, you know, if, let's say you've got your user object has an address child object. Deserialization will work. JSON will know based on the JSON data that comes back, it will know how to populate all those relevant objects and that sort of thing. Yeah. Picasso. Picasso is another ex excellent library. It is great for image downloading and caching. It is made also by Square. I don't know if you noticed, but anything good in Android land is actually made by Square or J1. That's not much at Square. Huh? Who works at Square? Yeah, exactly. So it's like. Yeah, there are a lot of good libraries made by, made by them. So Picasso is all about helping you download images and cache them. Another big thing that Android historically has not done very well at all. Uh, you would have to, you'd have to write async tasks to download images and all sorts of stuff. So all you have to do is 
Picasso, you give it a context, you give it an image URL, and you give it an image view to load into. And everything that top line of code just did is all in the background thread. It takes care of caching the image for you. It downloads your image. So it's very common to see Picasso, say, used in list views, list views that have images, right? In your list view adapter, you'll have Picasso making calls to these, these uh, images. And then it, it'll actually pull a cached version if it has actually already loaded that image. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Picasso also provides a lot of friendly uh, image methods. You've got um, resizing, you've got sort of orientation. You can specify a placeholder image for your image view. So let's say you've got an image view and it's going to be downloading a remote image. It, will, it can place a drawable in that view by default. So let's show this one by default. And you know what? If the image doesn't load, let's show this error image. And then finally, when we're done, put the image that you loaded into the image view. Uh, can you change the resize to be just whatever your image, your device is? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, like, by default, you probably, you know, like, in a lot of cases, you wouldn't resize an image. Like, you would probably get a somewhat large image, and it would just automatically scale into so you just leave it right off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is just there if you need to. You know, there are times when you need little mini versions. And, I was just curious. Yeah. All right, we will talk about ORMs. Why? Because inline SQL strings are yucky. Chances are good your um, app will need to cache some amount of data. And chances are good that your app will be caching data that maps to your data objects, some level of model objects. ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping. Map. Mapping? Mapper. Yeah. Anyway, all, all ORMs, what the ORMs do is they allow you to um, have your data object, like user, that has first name, last name, phone number, and work with that object instead of having to write like inlines. H has anybody ever written just like straight up SQL like query strings? Yeah, it sucks. I mean, it's, it's terrible. And it's so not maintainable. So ORMs allow you to abstract all that away and um, work just with objects, the objects that you natively work with in your app. So we'll hit three. There's three. There's actually quite a few. They all have their trade-offs, so I'm going to try and hit like, you know, what some pros and cons of each. Uh, ORM Lite is a good one. It's arguably the first feature, uh, first full feature of ORM that came out on Android. Uh, it supports quite a bit of complexity as far as ORMs go. You know, ORMs have a legacy on like enterprise Java systems and .NET, things like Entity Framework, that there are these massively complex object relationships that are backed by these massively complex databases. ORMs, full featured ones like um, uh, N, I can't think of them, what their names are. But there, there are some big ones that they're just, they're super, super heavy, super, super full feature. Android just doesn't have that level of complexity, generally when it comes to data caching and object interactions. Uh, but ORM Lite is maybe one of the ORMs that actually gets closest to having a lot of the complex functionality that you, that you might expect. But it is a bit complicated to set up. It's got, a, it's a lot more overhead than other ORMs. I'm just starting to use ORM Lite, and it uses model objects. It puts table mm -hmm. annotations and yep. stuff like that. And originally, I thought I'm trying to use it with retro pit. Yes. And originally, I thought I could use the same models and put and retrofit annotations and ORM Lite annotations on there. But it doesn't seem to work because retrofit uses model objects based on the JSON. Right. And that doesn't always match. No. So, so what, yeah, what he's talking about is you can annotate uh, object that object properties or object fields, and um, they they will actually end up corresponding to database tables in your objects. Your objects will be mapped to database tables, and those about those fields will map to columns in that table. Well, the JSON might be named differently, but the way to get around that is by there is an attribute or an, sorry an annotation called a serialized name. So you can name your property whatever you want, and then if you need it to map to something different in the uh, JSON, you can use an annotation that tells the JSON parser what its name actually is. I can show you that code if you want. 
because it will work. All right, another ORM is covered. It's very simple to use, uh, but I don't even, I, it doesn't handle complex object relationships very well, if at all. Uh, it's, it's generally pretty good if you just have very simple data that you want to persist and query. And then finally, Kenton's going to lynch me, but Sugar ORM, that's Kenton right there. Um, Ken, uh, Sugar ORM has an active record like syntax, so, and it's super easy to set up and use. So this is some sample code. So let's say you have a value object, or user object. All you do is you say it extends sugar record, and you, then you have to actually give it the type. And then you create your object, my user object, you set some properties, and then all you have to do is my new user.save, and it is just persisted to the database. That's it. And then let's say you want to get all the users in the database. It's a static method, so the user object dot find all of the user type. Um, and then the setup is equally as simple. You actually just set some properties on the Android manifest, and it just this sugar ORM takes care of everything for you. Um, but the risk is that it may abstract away too much. Um, it actually makes an interesting decision. So because these objects are mapping to database tables, there needs to be an ID column in the database. Well, these, most of these ORMs will, behind the scenes, create the ID table. So you don't, you know, so if you create a user object, you don't want it to, you don't want to have to put an ID, like which it represents a number in your user. It doesn't make sense. So the ORM takes care of that for you. But in the case of sugar ORM, it literally names the column ID, just straight ID. That becomes a problem if your API returns an ID, and it's named that. So you'll actually bump into conflicts and the objects won't be serialized, right, and stuff like that. Um, but if you want to do, and, and also uh, SugarRM does not really have any like built-in way to facilitate like async, so if you have large data sets, I don't know what its performance is. So, uh, but if you've got very simple data to save, it can be a really cool way to just sort of drop, drop in persistence and you, know, you, you code it as if you would, were just sort of like you know, instantiating your objects and that sort of thing. Dating, because Java doesn't know how to date. Has anybody worked with date objects in Java? Yeah, it sucks. This is, this is like my nightmare. Every time I need to work with dates in Java, somebody like, oh, it's deprecated. Ah, just kidding. So there are two really good libraries. Joe Time is the big one. It's basically what Java dates should have been. It's got tons of great features that makes working with dates way easy. Um, there are easy date properties like get year, get month. You can do comparisons on dates really easily. You can do great, you know, very high performance or, or rather not, maybe not complex formatting, that sort of thing. So, yeah, Jota Times. If you're going to do anything with dates, it's just, I, 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 I still don't know the Android date and calendar APIs every time I have to look through So Jota Times will be good. And then pretty time. Uh, pretty time will, will take a time step stamp and uh, convert it into something readable, like this happened five minutes ago, or this will happen in two hours. And so it, it, it sort of has its own heuristics around what that is. So it'll be like if something, you know, if you if you do pretty time on something on a date that was just created, it'll be like it happened just now, and then it'll be like one minute ago, five minutes ago, um, and you can control it. It supports multiple different languages and stuff like that. So for displaying times in a pretty way. It's a very good library. Licenses dialog, because you've got to give props. So you've taken all these new libraries, and you put them in your app, and you're using them. But the licenses for these libraries uh, dictate that you give credit for them. Most, most libraries will do that. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure Apache software license would require that you um, give attribution, MIT license, maybe not so much, but maybe you want to be nice. So licenses dialog is just that, is a library that allows you to give attribution for open source libraries. And what it does is it pops up a, a modal dialog that shows all the information. So it's got a really nice interface. So you create this notices object and you say add notice. So for example, I want to give attribution to Butterknife. So I give it the name, I give it the URL where Butterknife is, I give it the author, 
And then there's actually this object type for what type of license it is. So Apache software license, MIT license, so on and so forth. And you can create your own. Like there are some licenses that are not facilitated by the library by default, like Creative Commons. So I actually had to create a Creative Commons one. So you can extend the class. Then you do a builder. And so licenses dialog is itself open source, so it's, it does need to be attributed. So it's very like meta. But if you want licenses dialog to attribute itself, you just do that. So you say set include own license. So now you are giving proper attribution to your other libraries and the library itself. And then you build it, and then to show the mobile dialog, you just call show. So it's a real, there are other libraries like this out there that give proper attribution to libraries, but it's a really good way to do it. All right. This retro lambda, this is not uh, really a list. I, I like good code quality. I like, I just like writing good code. And <clears throat> retro lambda is, does not offer any uh, functionality other than uh, making your Java code much more attractive. So is, are people familiar with lambda syntax or anonymous functions, inline functions? So you'll see what retro lambda allows you to do. So anyway, why it's called bringing sexy forward is because lambda Functions are supported in Java 8, but Android does not fully support Java 8 yet. What Retro, Retro Lambda allows you to do is it allows you to write Java 8 syntax more or less for lambdas and use it in your Android project. So, the Lambda magic. Once again, if you've written any amount of Android code, you see this constantly. Set on click listener, new anonymous interface, on click, make the call. That is not correct. Or no, 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 that is, I think it converted this for me. <laughs> Pretend this isn't there. It's supposed to be that. It's just supposed to be that. <laughs> that's awesome. Like, wait, why am I setting that? That in itself is a lambda. Pretend that's not there. That's what I get for finishing my presentation today. Anyway, what lambdas allow you to do is to turn all this crazy boilerplate and do that. So the lambda is, this is the, function argument, and then this is the actual function that you end up calling. It is beautiful, it's pretty, it is terse. So for me, I just, I find it so much better. So behind the scenes, what it is actually doing is it is actually creating all of this anonymous interface instantiation and stuff like that, but if you have an interface that has one method, it can be converted into a, into a, a lambda. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Do you have any, how does it do that? How does it actually do that behind the scenes? And so is there a pre-compiler yes. that's involved? Yes. So the, the, the trick is, is you do have to have Java 8 installed. And so you have to have Java 8 installed and have Android Studio pointing at Java 8 as your Java development kit and whatnot. Then you, uh, the uh, Retro Lambda, it's actually, it's actually, see for Android specifically, it's a Gradle plugin. So you reference the Gradle plugin in your build.gradle, and then it takes care of doing that for you. So you have to have Java 8 installed. You have to um, set up the project to use Java 8 syntax, which is a setting in Android Studio. And then you have to bring in the Retro Lambda Gradle plugin. And then it does exactly what you said. It precompiles this code into Java 7 compatible bytecode. Because it all boils down to the JVM anyway. So, um, so it's, it's syntactic sugar for sure. But so this is what I was talking about earlier. Retrofit really shines with Retro Lambda. So now, this observable, we're making this call, we're subscribing, and we're responding. This is, this is the response right here. This is what happens once we get our data back. This is what happens when we get in error. So you get these super, super terse callback-like operations. And uh, it just, it's so much more readable. If I, I was going to pull up. If you remember this, you would have to do all this, right? So it was this crazy action. You have to instantiate all these things. That turns into. this. So it's way less code. 
and I, I think so, so beautiful. So I'm, I now use RetroLambda in all my Android projects. So that's it. All right, we are nearing the end, and now it's your turn. I want to hear from you guys if there's any libraries that you really like, or have any questions or whatever. Shout them out. Ken, what's your what's your what's the library I didn't I didn't cover? Dagger. You can leave. Um, <laughs> Dora money. What's that? Dora money. What's that? It's like Dora time. Dora money for money. Oh, nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. One library I realized that I didn't I didn't put in here is a library called Calligraphy, and Calligraphy is a library that allows you to. Um, do custom fonts in Android a lot easier than you would otherwise. Um, making a like a view that is you know, like making an app that's styled with a custom font historically has involved a lot of um, like extending text view and stuff like that. It's just really really painful. But calligraphy does a lot of kind of magic for you and allows you to just use styling for custom fonts and that sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think Android has pretty good internationalization support by default. Although I guess I don't know, maybe in different different yeah, regions. Yeah, probably yeah. If you have a different font, you have to add Yeah. Assets. Yeah. But yeah, you would be able like if if there's like a special like region specific font that you needed to include, calligraphy would be a great way to do. It. Yeah. Have you heard of any libraries that are good at handling video on Android? No. I haven't. Video is sort of a, yeah. it's one of those weird frontiers that Android, I know there's a library that does animated GIFs. I don't think that's what you're looking for. But yeah, video playback is always, like, anytime we're faced with doing that, there's, I honestly haven't looked at the landscape for video playback lately. Yeah. Have you considered uh, contributing back to the code that you wrote to that Creative Commons stuff? I have. Yeah, I have. Um, I, uh, I like yeah, because I I wanted to because it's like I'm sure I'm not the only one who would want that, you know, Creative Commons license. But I uh, it, this is all done in service of my Android Wear app, and I actually uh, did a pull request uh, on a RSS parsing library. RSS atom parsing library, and the guy hasn't accepted it yet. So, so for, a, for an RSS aggregator, the, you know, the bread and butter is the RSS library, so I kind of wanted to contribute there more than the licenses dialog. But I, I have thought about that. So uh, where to go from here? So how can you learn about great Android libraries? This website is awesome, androidarsenal.com. Uh, it's impressive how many libraries there are on this website. Uh, they have a, they, you can you can filter by types of libraries, view, ORM, network, all sorts of stuff. Um, I mean, it's anything and everything. So you got to be judicious about what you find there because there might be a lot of crap there. But there's just a lot there. There's actually a Google Plus community that um, is Android libraries on GitHub. That is also I found out a lot about a lot of really good. Uh, libraries that way, and literally Google searches ORM for Android, network for Android. Like, chances are, if you do a Google search for some library you're looking for, someone's going to have posted about it on Stack Overflow. For most cases, there's going to be a Stack Overflow. And there's going to be tons of links, and I, I'm just curious, what sites do you guys use? Like, I, I, there there are a lot of others, but I, like a lot of what I do is just like my coworkers. They tell me things, but there might be other really good websites out there too. Well, that is it. Thank you. Thanks for coming.